Welcome, welcome, welcome to K Drama School. I'm your host, Grace Jung. Hello. Thank you so much for joining me today, you guys. Lovely to be here. How was your week? How was your week? How was your weekend? How was your life these last seven days? Hmm? How was that? I guess I'm back on uh, back on the uh, TV um, watching phase again. Maybe I am a little less um, distracted or maybe I'm more depressed. I don't know. But I am now able to watch TV again. I think it's also a good time for TV, isn't it? Yes. There are two uh, romantic um, comedies two romantic K-drama romantic comedies on Netflix that seem to be doing pretty well. I mean, it has my attention, right? Every Wednesday, every Thursday, every Saturday, every Sunday. I'm I'm liking both of them. I mean, I like the weekend one more. I mean, it's far superior, right? The one about the veterinarian who goes around touching people's asses to see their past. What a hilarious premise. I mean, that is like a really funny, wacky, camp-ass premise. And... You know, like in the past, Han Jimin, like she didn't really do a whole lot for me, but wow, she is blowing me out of the water with this this show. She's amazing. Um, Behind Your Touch, right? That's the show. Yeah, she's she's so good. Um, so yeah, I'm, I am watching quite a few shows right now. I don't know if I'll have any shows to cover by next week. I don't know. Again, like I'm just winging this shit every week. It's like, is Grace going to cover a show? Is Grace going to watch enough TV to cover a show this week? I don't know. You guys, I'm just I'm just going with it. I'm just flying by the seat of my pants and just going with it, man. This is being present. Hmm? This is this is me being here now. This is me really living in the moment. You see? You hear me? You feel me? Yes. All right, so today I'm going to talk about the show Glitch, which is a show that's on Netflix. It is a Netflix original series. This is not on any of the cable or broadcasting stations. This show was written by Jin Hanse, who also wrote Extracurricular, which is arguably Netflix's first original K-drama series, which came out back in 2020. Remember that? And I think Glitch is a lot more balanced relative to Extracurricular because Extracurricular... While while it has a very provocative premise, it doesn't have much heart. Like I would I would say extracurricular lacks heart completely. I don't know where the heart is in that show. And any show that lacks heart is going to be imbalanced. Glitch on the other hand has a lot of heart and I think it works better than extracurricular because well, first of all, it's like less violent. I mean, extracurricular was just so gratuitously violent. And I I would say that it was the director that he worked with, perhaps. I mean, yeah, also like the narrative. But yeah, the director that he worked with, I don't know. It was just like the most bloody fucking show about teenagers that I've ever seen in my life. Uh, Glitch has a lot of heart. You have these two female protagonists on the show. And um, it's it's very interesting because you have the protagonist, Hong Ji-ho. She breaks up with her boyfriend after he asks to move in together. And then he gets abducted by aliens and disappears. And then Ji-hyo starts seeing aliens right around the same time. And it's like, well, what is that? Why does that happen? She joins a UF cl- UFO club and then meets her childhood friend, Hobora there. Uh, Hobora is somebody that Jihyo abandoned after Jihyo went missing for a couple of days and was found alone in a field. And her parents and the police basically scapegoated Pura for Chiho's disappearance, even though Pura was not the one that was responsible for Chiho's disappearance. What impressed me about this series is the uniqueness of the storyline. It's a very idiosyncratic story. And the directorial choices made by Nu Tok, who is a filmmaker, and she doesn't have a very extensive filmography. She directed a couple of films like 10 years ago. And then and recently she directed a uh, NBC series called SF8 Manshin, which I haven't seen, but I am now very keen on checking it out because I, I liked Glitch and I like the fact that Nodok is a woman and she is directing TV shows. And I also like that Nodok worked with Yi Donghee uh, in that series, the Manshin series. And Yi Donghee returns on Glitch, right? He plays the boyfriend. I love Yi Donghee, by the way. If if Netflix had advertised this show to me with Yi Donghee's face instead of 
what's her face? Uh, Chun Yebin's face. I would have watched it way sooner. Way sooner. Uh, I know that Chun Yebin has popularity because she was on that show Vincenzo opposite Hong Jun Gi. But I could not watch Vincenzo. I, I know I've said this before, but like the show sucks. Also, Chun Yebin's performance on Vincenzo was so forced. And so unconvincing. And she was like trying so hard to be funny and it never landed with me. It was awkward and affect- affected. It was a fucking nightmare. So I just stopped watching it. Like even Song Jun Gi could not save that show for me. But on Glitch, Chun Yebin is so much better. Like she is very good at playing a weirdo. She's actually better when she's more reserved and centered. Because I feel like on Vincenzo, she was like all over the place, like scattered energy glitch. We have this weirdo idiosyncrasy. OK, it's like looking at Korean society's freaks and geeks. And then, you know, these people take aliens seriously. Yeah, uh, the show actually takes aliens seriously. And that's not very typical in media content. If you look at any kind of Hollywood media, it's got the exact opposite tone, right? Like the show, the, the, the film franchise Alien, for instance. I mean, that's all horror. Horror, 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 right? With Sigourney Weaver. If you look at a movie like Annihilation, yeah, that's also got an alien theme. And it's, again, paranoia is behind it. Um, I guess the, the movie Arrival is a little bit different. Right. Like it's basically benign and benevolent aliens. And but then it's showing human reactivity and paranoia to the aliens and these um, UFOs arriving. Right. I've been getting into a lot of alien literature lately through uh, hypnotherapist Dolores Cannon. Uh, She's no longer alive. She passed away about 10 years ago, but uh, she like her books are still really popular and they sell they sell really well. Um, And I've been reading Keepers of the Garden. So Dolores Cannon basically is a hypnotherapist who does past life regression therapy. So that's when she takes her patients and puts them under hypnosis and then she she gets them to recall their past lives um, by uh, entering their subconscious mind. So um, like basic psychology stuff. So our conscious mind, like up here, the ego is very shallow. Uh, It's fragile and it's like always at the forefront. Okay, it's what keeps us neurotic and anxious. It's what keeps us defensive and hypervigilant. Okay, it's what gives us our personality, so to speak. Okay, it's what creates entertainment. It's what creates fights. It's also what creates wars. Okay, however, our subconscious is so much bigger and deeper and has like so many sedimented wisdoms and lives and you know knowledge that like we just can't access um and bring to the surface not unless our conscious mind can handle it yeah so the subconscious mind that's sort of like if you guys are into akashic records right like akashic records is about going through one's past lives through through a shamanic regression therapy session, right? So hypnotherapy is um, the kind of hyp- hypnotherapy that Dolores Cannon used to uh, conduct is essentially, essentially Akashic record reading. So she goes through um, to the patient's subconscious place and then that patient will start channeling from these other lives that they had lived. And in Keepers of the Garden, she encounters this man named Phil, and Phil turns out to be a star child, meaning, like, he doesn't have any past lives. This life is his first life, and he came directly from a different planet, from the ETs. So he has, like, all this knowledge of what the ETs, like, his race of ETs, and what his planetary people have been working on, and what they know, and how they live, and yada, yada, yada. So it's like the whole book is just a conversation between Dolores Cannon and Phil when Phil is channeling this, the E.T. minds, basically. And uh, the book is fascinating because in the book, when Phil is channeling, he mentions a praying mantis-like machinery. It's basically a tool that the E.T.s use, but it is also a creature, and it freaks Phil out. Like the human persona, Phil, he is terrified 
and hates this object because it's not an object. It's an android. It's lifelike. It's a creature that moves around and has function. And it does the bidding of the ETs. Like if the ETs want something done, then this creature will go and follow through. Right. It's like us with Siri or Alexa. But this is like like a, an android that has flesh. And like they talk about this praying mantis thing in the book, and the book was published like I think in the eighties or nineties. And then we have this uh, praying mantis like creature in the last episode of the show, right? When or is it the second to last episode? I think the last episode when Pura and uh, uh, Chion or Chiho rather, when they get on the spaceship and then they have this encounter with this like freakish like long stick like looking thing. And I was like, oh, that's like uncanny. Like, I think either the director or the writer or both may have read Dolores Cannon or were influenced by Dolores Cannon's explanation of these praying mantis like creatures. Right. I mean, this is written again decades ago. So, I mean, I'm sure like this imagery was floating around in the in the, um, you know, UFO and alien world. Right. This show also has an interesting theme of questioning reality. Okay, so Gio is always wondering this, like, what is reality? Is reality an objective thing or is it subjective? Right. Or is it a constant negotiation between the two? Gio used to have a very subjective reality when she was younger. We see it in the first episode, right? Like Gio is sitting or lying in a field, like thinking, meditating while listening to stuff. And she's like crying tears. And she's like really like yearning for the UFOs to come and visit her. And that was all she cared about. She only cared about UFOs, right? But then Chiho eventually forgot about her past self. She forgot what what her inner child wanted. And what that kid wanted was to hang out with UFOs and aliens. But she completely forgets this. She leaves it behind. She decides to assimilate into society the quote-unquote objective reality. And she, like, loses Pura in the process. But Pura, you know, she's, like, hooked on this stuff, right? Chihyo was the one that introduced Pura to this stuff. And then uh, even though Chihyo abandoned Pura, Pura continues to live her life promoting UFO conspiracies. So Pura is the catalyst for adult Chihyo to reconnect with her younger self again. Yes, the one that she put far behind her. And the show has a very intense queer theme between Pura and Chihyo, right? It's interesting that when Chihyo's boyfriend asks her to move in with him, that's when she starts seeing aliens again. And when was she seeing aliens? She was seeing aliens when she was with Pura. And shortly after that, after he asks to move in with her, he just he disappears. And what does she do? She goes looking for him and then she ends up finding Pura. Oh, so there you go. Synchronicity. Huh? What is what is being said here? Huh? Like Chihyo needs to face her truth, doesn't she? Is she somebody that should be with a man or is she somebody that should be with Pura? Yeah. Um, in the last episode, Chihyo asks Pura to move in with her. And that's really that's a very queer proposal because in the beginning, Chihyo's boyfriend asked her to move in. She said no. She broke up with him. And then here she is in the last episode. She's asking Pura to move in with her. It's a very like queer love moment. The age when Chiho and Pura first meet in that early pubescent period is a very queer phase for children, right? Because children are blossoming into early adulthood and they're exploring their identities. They're also exploring their hormones. They're also coming into being somebody new. It's like a transformative sort of transition phase. That's when Pura and Chihyo meet. That's also when they have this UFO encounter. And, you know, Chihyo is like such an open and dedicated geek to the UFOs and aliens. Whereas Pura is like this troubled emo girl who drinks alcohol and even this pairing is a very queer dynamic duo right you have this naive innocent young dork paired up with this troubled girl who has a lot of edge that's a very queer coupling right so there's queerness happening at multiple levels um Film and media scholar Whitney Monaghan wrote a monograph back in 2016 entitled Queer Girls Temporality and Screen Media, where Monaghan notices a pattern in cinema. She basically says that in these films, when the girls are in an adolescent age, they're very freely queer. 
But as they grow into adulthood, that queerness falls away, kind of like a scab. And then the girls uh, become assimilated to hetero society. Monaghan argues that queerness does not need to be limited to temporality or to be disguised as a phase to be grown out of. Right? Queerness is not a phase. It's not a phase that needs to be outgrown. This is the premise that Glitch is turning on its head. Okay? Whereas Chiho thought she grew out of her obsession with aliens and UFOs, these queer topics, as well as her queer love for Pora, Pora maintained that love all those years. Yeah. Pora never forgot about Chiho because she continued on her UFO and alien hunt. And it's evident how much love Pora still had for Chiho because she was so angry at Chiho when they reunited later. And she was angry because Chiho abandoned her. Yeah, and this hurt Pura's feelings. That hurt was very evident in how angry she was, right? There's also the question of mental health on this show. Chiho sees a therapist named Hyungwoo, and their informal way of speaking to each other makes it evident that they are friends. And I personally don't think it's okay for anybody to uh, get psychological help from somebody that you know personally. Like, somebody you know personally should never be your doctor. That's sort of an unwritten rule, but I guess it happens a lot. And maybe it's happening in Chiho's case because perhaps she finds it safer to work with a friend, a trusted friend, rather than a stranger perhaps due to the stigmatization of mental illness in South Korea. So that's interesting. Chihyo has a moment where she's really unsure of whether or not to believe her own psyche. Like she really wonders whether or not her mind is reliable or trustworthy. And this moment also happens in Keepers of the Garden when Phil has a recent um, like you know, hypno regression moment and a memory surfaces and he discusses the time that he was like brought onto a spaceship and like they were doing things to his back and it was very disturbing to him. And, uh, you know, he like throughout that part of the book, he's wondering whether or not he's losing his mind and he's actually in real distress. Now, Cannon's book repeatedly emphasizes that the ETs have been purposefully revealing themselves you know, since the beginning of human civilization, over the eons of the existence of this planet. And they've been doing it in small doses to not freak people out. So every time there is a UFO sighting and somebody like films it and uploads it and it like ends up on the news or whatever, that is the ETs doing that on purpose to be like, we're here, we're out here. We don't want you to freak out. We're just showing you like our spaceship, like here we are, hey, and then they like just like go away, right? Because if they reveal their full bodies and their full like mechanisms, a thousand percent, like the United States would try and blow them up using nuclear weapons. A thousand percent, like they were watching everything happen during the Cold War. The Cold War is when there were the most like alien like interventions and stuff. It's actually really funny. Um, I really recommend that movie, Close Encounters with the Fifth Kind. Um, uh, Stephen Greer is in that movie. Uh, he's a ufologist and he like talks a lot about this stuff. But it's really interesting if you're into this. So the ETs in Canon's book basically say that they reveal themselves in small doses to humanity in order to not freak people out. Because if they did it very suddenly, people will freak out and then they will try and go to war. So, well, and it's like, why? Why do people do that? Think about think about like w- how our minds function just in general, okay? Our conscious mind, our ego mind is always defensive, okay? It's always arguing somebody. It's always uh, afraid and anxious and worried. Why? Because the future is unknown. The future is unknown. So it's always like plotting and trying to control it and trying to guess, okay? So our minds have evolved to be very defensive and it has its guard up all the time. And the ETs are just like, we know that about you and your brain. And so we're not going to flood you with all this information that you can't handle all at once. Like they are very much aware and um, they know what we can and cannot handle. Right. And that's like very much written in the book. It's written. It's talked about in all the documentaries. But what I love about Dolores Cannon's book, though, is that like she's not advocating for anything. She doesn't have high stakes. 
You know what I'm saying? Like, she's not, like, saying, well, because of humanity and because of the earth and blah, blah, blah. Like, she's not, like, trying to convince anybody to do anything. She's not even con- trying to convince people to believe in aliens or UFOs. She's just documenting and reporting. And it's very neutral. It's very chill. And that's why I like her books. And that's also why I like some of her lectures. Because she's just really chill about it. You know, she's not, like, like Stephen Greer. He's very intense about it. You know, he has like an agenda. It's very politicized. He's very political. Uh, And, you know, like he's like a totally different energy. I'm not so much into that. I'm more about like Dolores Cannon and her very like calm sort of approach towards this whole thing. Because it's like this stuff is only interesting to people who's interested in it. Right. It's not something for everybody. You know, it's like... um, I don't know. It's like it's a, a different flavor. It's a different flavor. Like not everybody's going to be into this alien flavor. I think that's also why I find Glitch very compelling because um, Chiho and Pura have this friendly encounter with the aliens, right? And this encounter is so meaningful to the both of them because Pura knows. Pura knows the truth that Chiho was taken on a spaceship like she saw it she witnessed it happen and this is in her memory but she still can't quite remember what went on and then um they you know get caught up with the whole cult shit but it's like interesting how on glitch that cult is very much in reverence and awe of ufos and aliens like they want this encounter they want to have this meeting but it's like tinged with the sickness, right? Like they got this fucking cult leader who wants everybody to kill themselves. Like the fucking, you know, it's like typical stuff. When Pura and Chiho finally meet or get on the alien UFO spaceship, they have like a very personal and wonderful moment. And it's like necessary for their healing. Why? Because Chiho literally was afraid that she had lost her mind. You know, even though Pura knows the truth and is trying to convince her friend, like, no, you haven't lost your mind. You're actually getting your mind back. You're getting your memories back. Like, Jiho is all confused and all out of whack. And then this wonderful saving grace moment comes, right? It's like, no, don't let the world gaslight you into thinking or convincing you of some other reality that you don't want anything to do with. Trust your own voice. Trust your own interests. Trust your own love. Trust your own gut. Trust your own heart. It's all about affirming, affirming the subject and their subjective reality. And I think that's a really beautiful message that Glitch has. And I think that's where the heart is. Yes. So much better than extracurricular. Holy shit. Yeah, extracurricular was just like, uh, it was just too much. It was super stressful. This one, this this show, so much more, you know, balanced and sweet. Um, the other thing I loved about Glitch, more than anything else on the show, more than the directing, more than the story, like more than the acting, more than all of this, beyond all else, I thought the best thing about this show was the production design. I don't know who the production designer is. And honestly, I feel like these uh, K-dramas need to be a little bit more like hyped up about their production designs and their production designers. Yeah. Who are your production designers? You really need to flaunt that shit because Glitch had excellent, beautiful production design. Every single like scene, the interiors of these homes and these rooms, like the way that the decoration is in the back, the mise en all of that was so nice because it just looked so like handcrafted and idiosyncratic. It looked like a person put their heart and mind and soul into the creative, uh, the creativity of that thing. And it seemed to reflect the passion that these characters have for their subject matter. So yeah, kudos to the production designer on Glitch. Excellent stuff. I loved it. 